we pray. Amen. Are uh, in the midst of a blessed time together on this day. Uh, just a couple of things I, I want to say before I uh, progress into the message, uh, something I did not mention during the announcements. For our uh, parents and children, uh, we do have uh, packets. Uh, the, uh, they are here, uh, in the, I think in the back row there. So if your children are here, haven't picked up one of those, please make sure they get that. Um, uh, thanks to our uh, children's director, uh, Alicia, for preparing those. But they are a discipleship resource for your children. And so we want to make sure that you have that and that uh, they are helpful for you. If you have any feedback, please let Alicia know. We want to make sure that is helpful for you and for your children. Uh, secondly, uh, as, a, as a point of, of personal um, privilege, I, I need to say, uh, many of you, I, I'm looking at your, your families are here, and as you see, uh, mine is not. Um, I, I believe in leading by example, but, uh, but I, I need to speak to that. Um, my, um, my, my, my family, um, my, my better half and daughter, uh, they, as you all know, um, ben, Benita goes and she uh, visits, uh, she takes care of her mother on a regular basis. And so there's times and schedules and, and time, days in which uh, they go. And this was, this was her weekend to be there, uh, to take care of her mother. And, and so I told her, you know, that's perfectly fine. You know, so she is loving and serving her mother on this weekend through tomorrow. And so, but they did assure us they're joining us via live stream. So they're on right now. And, and so uh, we say hi to uh, Benito and to uh, Mother Pearl. And so we're grateful for for them to join us today. So that's the, that would be the, the reasons why, uh, but, uh, but we certainly are grateful they're joining us uh, online. And I certainly are praying for all of us. And so, um, but we are great. We're grateful uh, to be uh, to be able to share in this way. Um, as we um, now go to our message, uh, turn with me in, in the in the Gospel of Luke in your Bibles. We are going to uh, put on pause for our study uh, of First Peter at the school where I teach. Uh, there is this brother, uh, one of my students, and uh, one of my classes, and oftentimes students will come up and ask me things about pastoring or the ministry, and, and this brother asked me about uh, doing the Lord's Supper, and, uh, and this was, again, about three weeks ago, and at that time we were planning to do ours, and so we were talking about how best to do it now and, and to be safety conscious, and, and in, our, in our church have, have not had a chance to do it. And uh, over uh, about over a year and a half, and so like with his church as well. And so, what I what I suggested to him, I said, you know, what would be really neat if 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 you know if you have the 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 communion service, the Lord's Supper, and everything that you do, even the message you preach, is is fit, or it is it is in in uh, the purpose of the Lord's Supper. And I made that recommendation to him, and then I kind of afterwards I thought, like, you know what? I should follow my own advice there. And uh, anyway, he did it last week. He said it went real well, so this week we're doing it, and so um, we're trusting it'll go well for us as well. So Luke chapter 22, the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Luke. So we'll resume with First Peter next week, but uh, we're going to Luke on this day. Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. You found it? Um, signify by saying amen. 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 I like to hear amens in the church. Amen. It reads as follows. When the hour had come, he, that is Jesus, sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For, for I say to you, I will no longer 
eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. We'll stop our reading there for today's message. Father in heaven, Lord, we are th grateful. We thank you for bringing us here on this day. And we, thankful, we are thankful, Father, that we have this occasion to celebrate your supper, to remember your death. Father, we pray now that you will uphold your servant to do your will in this moment. Father God, that your death will be seen today in a, in a fresh and a renewing way for each of us. Oh Lord, I pray that each of us will Walk closer to you, Father. We'll be cleansed of our sins. And Lord God, we will honor you in every way. We'll say yes to whatever you say to us on this day in the name of Christ. So, oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer and all the people of God said amen. Amen and amen. Remembering what Jesus did for us. Remembering what Jesus did for us. Just recently, our nation commemorated the 20th anniversary of 9-11. That date is etched in our memory as a time that needs to be never forgotten. It was a momentous time where our nation was shaken for what took place. It was a time where we were awakened to the danger, to the vulnerability we were under. It was a time where it was a time where we saw people who died. We, we, we saw people who cried. We saw people who prayed. We, we saw people who were at a place realizing that they, we, were shaken from whatever, whatever ease, whatever comfort we were in. It was, it was shaken. And so the, the theme that was mentioned often as 9-11 was celebrated a few weeks ago was we will never forget. We will never forget. The memorials that were held was done so that this, this event will be remembered. Yes, it will be in the history books, but it will be in some ways remembered when people come together and they reflect upon what took place. There are some things, there are some, there are some events in history that must never be forgotten. This Lord's Supper, this 
what we call the Last Supper, must never be forgotten. It must be remembered by Christians because it is the it is what we consider to be one of the one of the the, the ordinances one of the continuing ordinances of the church that's to be practiced and and the is practice is symbolic of a of a of an of an event that teaches us something very important about the Christian faith. So, so in Christianity, we have, we have two practices that, that speak something very uh, poignantly to us. One, of course, is the Lord's Supper, the other being baptism. These are signs and they point to a deeper reality. And the Lord's Supper, it points to the reality of Jesus and his death. Now, we look to the practice, we look to the, the symbol for what it means. We, we don't become fixated with the sign itself. Because if we, if we, we focus on, on the sign and we miss the deeper reality, then we miss the point. Jesus, at this moment in celebrating this last Passover with his disciples, he is pointing them to a truth that they must always remember, and it is to be practiced through the life of the church. Not to get fixated on the sign, but to look to the deeper reality for which it represents, for which it means. You know, when it comes to signs and things like that, it, the, the reason we, we must make sure that we understand the significance of what it means is that if we, if we become all engrossed, or at least we, if we let the sign itself become all there is and never face the reality, we become like the person who, who takes someone to a restaurant. And, and they go to the restaurant, and you're with them, and, and you're looking over the menu and saying, hey, that's good, and that's good, and this meal is good. I've had this one, and all, all of these are good. And the person responds back, well, which one have you had? Well, I actually haven't had any of these, but they look good. You, you, the, the sign in menu says one thing, but your experience says another. The Lord's Supper is to be experienced. It's to be taken. It's to be taken with the sense that there's a reality behind what this teaches. We must remember what Jesus did for us. We must acknowledge the sign while embracing the reality to which it points. We remember in celebrating the Lord's Supper what Jesus did for us. Here Jesus, as he takes this Passover meal with his disciples, it says when the hour had come and he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. If you read the Verses leading up to this text, you'll know that Jesus made preparation for this celebration. He, he didn't just show up and they kind of gathered what they could. He didn't do, do like most of us do for our meals. We, you know, just kind of on the way home, just stop by the grocery store and find whatever you find, and that comes out a meal. But Jesus had made preparation for this. He was intentional that they would go to this room and they would bring these elements for them to partake of the supper. And as they partake of the supper, Jesus says he sat down. He was with them. There is a, there's an element, there's a, the element of unity that we need to not overlook with this. That's why today the church comes together to celebrate the Lord's Supper because it is a matter of being together. Communion, communing together. Jesus celebrated with them. He was present with his disciples, and he began by telling them that with fervent desire, I have desire. This is the strongest, the strongest statement of desire we see in the original language. With desire, with fervent desire, I have desire. In other words, Jesus is saying, I have looked forward to having this time with you, to eating this Passover with you. And he says, before I, was, I suffer. So Jesus is pointing them toward a, a, a time in which he will suffer. 
He wanted them to look forward at this time to the suffering that will take place. And after his death, he wanted his disciples and want us to look back to the suffering that he, that he did for us. Jesus here, as they took this first cup, if you're reading very carefully, you will notice that there is a cup that is passed before they take the bread and another cup that is given after they took the bread. Well, Luke here is unique in that, uh, from the other Gospels, in that he points out that there is a cup that is passed uh, that is at the beginning of the meal. This is, was a Jewish Passover, and there are four cups that are passed. The first cup is given, after which the uh, people will sing psalms, uh, you know, from the Hallel Psalms, and then they take the meal. Well, the first cup that's passed, Jesus already sets the expectation that this meal is different from anyone that you ever had. It's the Passover meal that the Jews will celebrate, but he says that, that this is the one I have greatly desired to eat with you. But he also goes forward and says, makes a strong negation that, 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 that he will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He's saying that this is, in other words, the last supper that we eat here. But it is, it is there, there's a promise that we will eat a supper in the future, in the kingdom of God. So the Lord's Supper, it calls us to look back to what Jesus did at Calvary. But it also calls us to look forward to sitting with Jesus and to, and to eating with him in the day, in that last day, when we are with him in eternity. There is a time, the scripture speaks of the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation, speaks of the millennial kingdom where the people of God will, will sit and Jesus Christ will be the one who will be at the head of the table and we will eat with him. This is the, this is the, the, the meal that, this is the supper he's talking about, looking forward to. But he's saying this is the one he's going to take now, but there's one that we will take later. No longer, no longer would they, these disciples need to celebrate the Passover and look back to the Exodus redemption. Now they can celebrate the Lord's Supper and look back to what Jesus did on the cross. He would no longer be physically uh, present to eat and to drink with them. But each generation of disciples, which includes us, will remember that the Lord desires this last meal and he gives meaning to it. He, here, Jesus, he, he makes this the final Passover and the first communion. He, he takes now, he's closing off this, this old covenant uh, where the law now has been fulfilled. And now he is moving on to the new covenant. And he is, is, is setting now that this bread that is taken and the, and the cup that is from which you drink, it has now meaning that points to him. The last Passover sacrifice has been made. As 1 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, Jesus Christ is now our Passover. Our Passover, the greatest Jewish festival and remembrance was the Passover. Jesus is saying now that he is the Passover. If you remember what happened back in Egypt when the Lord was delivering his people out of this place of hurt and oppression, of captivity, he brought forth judgment upon this nation. And the last judgment he brought, he, he told his people that you would slay the lamb, you would put the blood on the doorpost, and when the death angel comes, you, he will pass over you. Jesus is now designating himself as that Passover lamb whose blood is, covers us from the judgment of that we face when we stand before God in the last day, we will not have to stand before God in that judgment. We have been cleansed. We have been set free. We have been healed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The priests 
who would have to slay animals and they have, they have to have to do the bloody work of, of cutting them and, and sprinkling blood on the altar. No longer would any of that need to take place because Jesus says the once and for all sacrifice has been given. This is what this means. You may say, well, all of that is, is good, but how, what does that mean to me? He, Jesus here says that when he states in, in, verse, in verses 19 and 20, he said, this is my body which is given for you. Then in, likewise in verse 20, he says, this cup of the new covenant in my blood is shed for you. In other words, he's saying that the suffering that I'm going through, it is for you. And he was speaking to his disciples, but he was speaking to all of us. It is for you and it is for me. Because Jesus had no sin for which he would need to atone. But all of our sin, Jesus took our place. Theologians call that the substitutionary atonement. Jesus is our substitute. In other words, had Jesus not not stood in our place on the cross. Do you know what that means? That means we would have no hope of salvation. That means that, that we still carry the burden of our sins. That means that when we take our last breath, we would live. Or we would, we would, we would be lost forever in a in, a, in, a, in an eternity apart from God. That's what it means. But because he has did this for us, that means that we no longer have to pay the penalty for our sin. Jesus took it upon himself. And that is the hope that we have in him is that we don't have to bear the weight of our sins. We don't, have to, we don't have to pay. We don't have to stand in judgment for our sins. What does that mean for us now? That means that we can live a life in peace. Although we go through struggles and we have problems in our, in, in our existence here, but ultimately we have the greatest gift that's ever been given, that's Jesus Christ. He did this for us. It was for us. It was for you and for, uh, for me. The scripture says, he that is Jesus who knew no sin, he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What, what a powerful truth that is. That, that we can be in peace, have perfect peace when we consider the bread that, the, that represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and the fruit of the vine that represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. As they were going through the elements of this Passover meal, of course, there would be other elements there. But there were just two elements that Jesus pointed out that represented him. I represented this memorial. The bread for his body, the blood, the cup for his blood, the new covenant in his blood. What is that new covenant? Jeremiah 31, 31 talks about a new covenant where he will put the law in our hearts. Where through Christ, the Holy Spirit, would live in us. He, he would come and dwell with us forever. Jesus Christ, his blood represents the new covenant. And the blood was shed for us. You know, if you and I were, were to cut ourselves and we were to bleed or some other injury, we were to bleed. The first action we take is to stop 
the bleeding. Why is that? Because for those of you who are medically, um, you know, medically informed, much better than I am, you know that the life is in the blood. If you go to a doctor, to, your, to a medical professional, and if they want to check on your health, the first thing they do is they take what? They take the blood. The blood says so much about your health. The life is in the blood. And so while when we are injured, we attempt and we cut off or try to stop the bleeding, but Jesus Christ did not stop the bleeding. He shed his blood because, because without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sins. And so the question in your mind is, well, why all of that? Why would God go through all of that? Why would he have the Old Testament priest to kill all of these animals and, and then Jesus, for him, his only son, to die like he did? Why couldn't God just say, it's okay, sin can be forgiven? Because for God to just give a free pass to sin does not forgive sin. That's to overlook sin. For God to overlook sin would be for him to set aside his holiness. Because God is holy. Sin has to be judged. The wrath of God has to be poured out on sin. Because he is holy. And that's good news for us. Because we stand before God because we have been cleansed of our sin. That word sin is a, it's a word, it's a hunter's word. It means to miss the mark because all of us are off in missing the mark that God has set. Jesus Christ helps us. He stands in for us. And so because God has, has forgiven our sin, he has made it right for us. Because he is holy, he now has given us forgiveness of our sins. That is the greatest gift that we ever need. For the forgiveness of sin. That's our deepest needs. Yes, we have physical needs. We have emotional needs. We have relational needs. But the deepest need we have is spiritual to be reconciled with our creator. And Jesus now says, do this in remembrance of what I suffered. Do this in remembrance of him. Remembering what Jesus did for us. How often should we do this? How often should we celebrate the Lord's Supper? Some would say that it should be done quarterly, or some would say yearly by the church. Some, some would say monthly. There are some who would say weekly. But 1 Corinthians 11.26 is helpful for us because it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So as often as we do it, we should do it in remembrance of him. How practical is this for us? It's very practical. Because day by day, we live in the peace that we have in Jesus Christ. Come what may, whatever happens in the world around us and what happens to us, we have a salvation that cannot be taken away because Jesus has secured it for us at the cross. God had to crush his own son that we may benefit and be reconciled to our creator. 
In celebrating this, the Lord's Supper, let us remember what Jesus did for us. Sin is serious. We must consider it to be that. We don't take it lightly because God didn't take it lightly. If he needed to crush his own son for our sins, then we need not be negligent nor disobedient nor apathetic about sin. We take it serious. Our sins are forgiven. And that we have been cleansed and washed. Now we walk in the newness of life. If there's any sin on your heart today, if there's any weight or guilt that's crushing you now, this is the time for you to bring that before the Lord. Bring that before the Lord. This is a day of deliverance that you can have God's blessing of forgiveness. You can have God's blessing of peace. To know that what you face, what you deal with, what you are hurting, where you are hurting, doesn't have to be that way going from here. This is a place where Jesus would say, do this, do this, do this in remembrance of me. If we keep our mind stayed on him, he, our God, keeps us in perfect peace. And thank God he did it for us, even though we didn't know we needed him to do it for us. You know, if someone did something for you, the right attitude is thanks. Not to say, well, I didn't ask for it. No, but you needed it. And the Lord knew what we needed. And he took care of that need at the cross. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So this is the time of the year where people kind of you know, have the Halloween things up and they see the blood or whatever. Just think about this. There is blood that has been shed for us that is precious, that is pure, and that, is, that brings us into the light, not the darkness. And that's the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for, Lord, just bringing us to this passage now to help us to see Lord, that you had us on your mind when you died for us. You knew the times in which we would live. You knew who we were before we knew ourselves. And yet, Lord, you still died for us. Lord, you knew that there would be one sacrifice for sin. And that was through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for doing what you did for us. For us. Lord, for us. As we, God, take these elements... May, may we be in remembrance of everything you did. For your name's sake, amen. For we were ever born. The Lord knew. He knew every wrong you would do. 
He knew every, every failure you would make. He knew everything before you knew it, before you did it. 